Here we are. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> I'm gonna get going and let me begin by saying that I approach this topic with a great deal of humility and to capture a little bit about um, the universe connected to uh, experiences of faith and spirituality and, re and its uh, relationship to nature is a daunting task to say the least. Um, I would like to begin by saying that, um, you know, I um, live a life which is um, really focused on the spiritual and that that is embedded in most of my my actions and it is because of the experiences I've had with the unseen world over the course of my lifetime in terms of um, connections to faith and expressions of healing um, with respect to awarenesses and different ways of knowing. I think that um, I've engaged in quite a long and personal journey around various traditions and understandings. So, I bring that to you today, as I say, with quite a degree of humility. I did a video for this. It, it took me all day to do the video, <laughs> frankly, and it ended up being like 20 minutes long. And so what I'm gonna do is power through this um, so that we can get into a more um, engaged discourse about how you experience and see these, uh, this, um, this topic and this way of being um, as relevant to our discussion. So I, I thought that I would start off with um, sort of four approaches that um, bring us closer to some of the challenges we're experiencing. And I would begin with the notion of creation and creation story as it, as it has been expressed uh, by various different cultures around the world. And I uh, looked for examples for you from the four directions. And so I uh, thought we would discuss that very, I would go through those very quickly and then have a little bit about the context we're in today and how consciousness and connection can impact our understanding of this um, area of, of, of exploration. So uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to start with a quote from William Wordsworth um, about nature teaching us and uh, how much comfort there can be and how much understanding can be achieved by our contact with the natural world. Uh, this creation story arises from Australia and um, its focus is that the father of all asked the sun mother to come down and breathe light into the world. Um, this is a Celtic, uh, the Triskelion, which is a Celtic uh, model uh, that looks at uh, birth life um, life, death, and rebirth, it, uh, past, present, and future. Um, it, it explores a whole range of movements and understanding in the cycles of life. And um, it's, uh, about, this, this is, arises from about 500 AD. So you can see that this is ancient, ancient expression of the system of life. This is the medicine wheel, the bighorn medicine wheel that was uh, found that has been dated to around 1200 AD. And again, I just want to share with you that the medicine wheel has actually been really important in my own exploration of development, understanding the gifts, under looking at different prophecies and traditions from different cultures about humanity and our collective consciousness and our experiences within that. Um, and the medicine wheel focuses on the um, <clears throat> the physical, the mental, the emotional, and spiritual aspects of each human being. And to be well balanced means that you have to walk through the different directions. Um, and uh, I looked at an Anishinaabe um, creation myth, which is the area that I'm from uh, as well. And again, the story is about Gitche Manitou and directing um, the Earth Mother to come and breathe life into the creatures. Uh, this is uh, from Japan. And uh, this is, uh, uh, it starts off with the notion of the void and frequency and sound moving through the void and the uh, lighter frequencies forming the heavenly essences, which in turn gave birth to the gods. And these are the two last gods that were born, Izanagi and Izanami, and they use a golden spear to give life to the Japanese islands. And finally, this is uh, the last direction. Um, uh, culture, uh, the African bush creation myth, 
And this is where Kanga, the uh, creator, uh, carved a hole to the surface. Um, all the animals and beings were living beneath the surface in perfect harmony. And when they, when they crawled through the hole in the earth up to the surface, they learned to distrust one another uh, because of the night. And uh, we saw the separation of man and beast. Uh, so anyway, each of these, each of these creation myths provide us with an explanation for how we came to be and what is our connection to the natural world within that story. All of the animals and creatures are mentioned. Humanity is part of a larger system. So what is our current context in light of some of those um, uh, representations of, of the creation of humanity? I'm just going to minimize my image here. Um, we have the science of separation, the notions of dominion and entitlement. Um, we saw also with, with philosoph philosophy, the development of biological natural laws, um, which were often in conflict with um, the way that social systems were governed and how social processes unfolded. And so we've attempted to apply natural law to social systems with some success and some challenges. Um, but it has not actually told the whole tale. We also are dealing with the economics of exploitation, which are driving inequality and consumption. And we see in current um, uh, messaging for and renewed calls for protection of the environment. I ran into this song by John Pride um, as I was preparing for this. And it was, again, just a perfect representation of the messaging we've had so far today about the corporate drivers and greed and uh, <clears throat> notions of progress versus destruction. Um, and what does that mean for us? The grief in that song is palpable and um, the loss of paradise is palpable. Once again, we've been, we've been uh, ejected from the Garden of Eden because of the way that we are interacting with nature. And so I turn to notions of consciousness and ways of knowing. How can we be one with consciousness? We've seen through many of the creation myths uh, ideas about our connectedness to one another, um, our loss of understanding. We also, uh, there are also many messages within the creation stories about all father, father creator, great spirit. Uh, there are some traditions that talk about life force around plants. Um, all, all, of, all species have a life force energy, and this is God present on earth. Um, I mentioned Teilhard de Chardin, who was a mystic, who was a Catholic mystic, who was actually silenced as a heretic because his thoughts were so progressive about the way nature interacts and how uh, spirit infuses all life. We've also seen in these traditions a uh, reverence for nature, respect for elementals. Uh, we talk and uh, learn about animal spirits, looking at totems. Um, we look at lessons and story arising from the natural world. And uh, we have lived experiences of um, respect for the secret life of plants, um, the spirit and energy of plants and their sacred role. So moving forward in consciousness, we can talk about the healing power of nature, and there are traditions around forest bathing, there's um, health messaging around grounding, even in the martial arts, we see connectedness to earth as a way for us to be, um, to handle uh, aggression. Um, there's quite a bit of, um, there's quite a bit of interest in animism, which is respect for elemental energies. We talk about sacred forests and sacred rivers. Um, we're understanding that water is seen as an elemental power and um, that there is a sense of the identity that goes uh, towards uh, these uh, life givers. And <laughs> in many traditions, we acknowledge indigenous um, we acknowledge the entities of animals and spirits. I did do a study of Rolling Thunder, who was a Cherokee shaman, and um, his teachings were really 
um, just so encompassing in terms of his relationship to nature and the way that he walked through the world. And his, um, his lifetime was dedicated to increasing awareness and consciousness about our role in the natural world and the importance of our spirituality within that. He talked about the fact that there is no separation. We are one and part of the whole and anything that affects one part affects the whole. And again, this brings us back to notions of systems, um, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. But I think most importantly from all of this, we can examine thinking about our connection. What is it that happens to us emotionally and spiritually when we experience destruction? How do we celebrate the various different um, elements of the natural world? And uh, what, are the, what, what do we make sacred? So the, the thing I wanna um, begin our discussion with is this conversation about us as apex predators who are above species, and this has been mentioned this morning, or whether or not we are actually part of an integrated consciousness we are part of Earth, part of Mother Earth, and this makes us more accountable for the well being of our world and all the species that are here. And I would just say personally that I think that um, I'm, as a good scientist, I spend a lot of time reflecting and critically thinking about what is truth in relationship to this inquiry. And when I connect my emotional health and my mental health to my spiritual health, in, with reverence for nature, I find that I am able to navigate life more happily, more successfully, more joyfully. So I'll leave it at that and just ask if you guys have any questions for that very brief overview. I'm going to try and get out of this. There we go. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to share my screen so I can take sure. note. Yeah. That would be great. Thank you so much. And Adarank is taking notes for us today. So thank you so much. No problem. I hope everybody um, can see it. Yes. Okay. And the, 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 the question for reflection that we have is what are some of the key implications for collective action we can take with this awareness? And also happy to hear your reflections or any personal sharing you have about your experiences with your in your relationship with nature does anybody have any comments Dion here. Um, thank you so much. I think I'm I'm just in awe with what you presented here in the way that you in the manner that you did. Um, there was one question that you said of or one statement that you had made that kind of hit me, and it I went to a, an example when you said, "What's that feeling or emotion, or what's your response to maybe destruction that you see?" And I was in Stanley Park walking with my dog, and there's this one heritage tree that has been attacked by a hatchet. And I was watching it happen more and more and more. And it was, it, it was so impactful to me that I couldn't walk by without feeling such anguish and pain. And I mm -hmm. saw the destruction continuing. And so I had to reach out. I called parks, I, I called the police. I tried to find out what I could do to try to take this pain away because it was, it got so much that I actually had to find a, a new place to walk. And so um, this conversation is so important. And I know that some people might uh, see nature very differently. Uh, to me, it, it affects me on such an emotional level that I go into, it, it affects my mental health and well being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they've done studies about um, plants having um, reactions to both positive messaging, negative messaging, threat, um, and the implications. And I didn't talk much about Findhorn, but, um, you know, the secret life of plants and Findhorn, the work that was done in communication with the plants, asking them to, um, you know, and insects, so so to support them in their growth and well-being, and then to have a conversation with the insects about 
um, sharing the plants and that they um, could, could have access to these plants if they left the rest alone. Um, similarly, there was a, one of the experiences with Rolling Thunder that I understand occurred was uh, he was walking through a swamp and uh, he had the researcher with him and the researcher was just being eaten alive, literally, and nothing was landing on Rolling Thunder. And the researcher finally said to him, what is it? Are you wearing some sort of gel? Like, what have you done? Because nothing's bothering you. And his response was that he had told them he was coming and that he asked to pass peacefully through their territory. And so he, he, was, uh, uh, he passed peacefully. He rose above the, the uh, vibration, uh, the, the base experience and, and moved into a higher realm of consciousness with the, with the plant and animal life that he was working with. And he did this over and over again. So, um, I, you know, I think that the exploration ahead of us in terms of connectedness and consciousness with the natural world is something we are going to be dealing with in a collective way um, in future when we look at mass devastation. I know when the Amazon was burning, my chest was tight. Just knowing what was happening there was devastating. And so if you are spending, you know, if you are open to different ways of knowing and if you um I, I think i think we'll understand considerably more over the next few decades as we become more comfortable with our connectedness to the natural world and this is not something that humanity um has never known this is something we've sort of left behind we many of us lost contact with what was possible in terms of the health promoting elements of being in nature and that's not to say that there are not many harsh aspects to nature there certainly are but we are part of a system and i really appreciate you sharing your story about the the ways that you tried to intercede and the feeling that you had because you were experiencing um yes we're going to stop screen view so we can see each other and I think that would be great because this is, um, uh, I'm just gonna go back. This will stop screen sharing. Okay, thanks. We'll go. So Adaranka, can you take off the screen share now so that we can see each other's faces while we're talking? Okay, just give me a second. Thank you so much. No I'm like loving what you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hello, everybody. Okay. It's so nice to see familiar faces, people I've known before. Betsy McKenzie has a public health award from many years ago. Betsy, God bless you for staying in, in the dialogue. Um, anyone else want to share? Betsy, you're on mute, Betsy. Yeah. I'm off. Um, a couple of things, and uh, I don't know which to say first because they're basically the same thing. Um, I think what we do um, I think we've all been traumatized. I think it's by design. I think we, we, the first thing we do is inoculate um, infants to being uh, to desen desensitizing them to other animals in the in the world. We feed them milk. We then feed them flesh, and then we do this weird thing where we write storybooks with animals talking. I don't understand all that, but it seems very tortured and messed up to me. So we're all graduates of that. So there's that trauma. And then secondly, as, and I think, uh, no, to stay with that, I think that is one of the areas where public health has a key role is to actually address this disconnect from a developmental perspective. Um, okay. We have all kinds of tentacles out to child development and, and all of that. So that's that. And then on a personal level, um, you know, if you're really connected to nature and other animals and don't um you know and 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 actually lay awake at night thinking about poultry being killed by the billions that sort of thing you're an outlier you're a freak um and uh mm -hmm. and i think if if i um one is not you um if if my kids eyes and my nieces and nephews eyes aren't rolling right back into their head when i talk about this stuff then i'm not doing my job so mm -hmm. I, i'm being a bit glib but uh, but it's no. it's actually recognizing how much of a, an outlier one one is in in at least our culture the the dominant western culture 
Yeah. Well, I love that because I looked at the history of women and I looked at the murder and massacre of the medicine women in Western tradition. You know, in Europe, all our medicine women were treated as witches and burned at the stake. Um, we have consistent, and I have to say the piece I found in early Celtic Christianity and in the medicine wheel and in understanding different ways of knowing was profound for me because I come through a tradition of, of, of intuition and empathy through my grandmother and precognition. And so I always had my entire life an awareness that the visible world was quite different, was impacted by realms we cannot see necessarily, but that we have a sense of. And when your consciousness is triggered by an activity such that you feel grief or loss or concern or fear, it's, the, it's, it's us being part of the natural world saying, wait, no, that's not how we do it. That's not how it needs to be done. And we have, you're right, we've worked very systematically to silence these voices, to, to systematize that there is one clinical trial way of knowing, to, to demean forms of research that are um, more hermeneutic, more interpretive, more expressive, We've, we've, got, we've had a number of, of interesting, uh, what I would see as some forms of structural violence that have sought to, to uh, demean and undermine what we know in spirit, what we feel in spirit. And my work has been to bring arts and science together because I've always had to walk between worlds. And uh, I needed to be understood and so I chose health informatics and health information science, and I chose history of collective movements and social movements. And I chose science as a way to be able to communicate my, my worldview in a way that, was accept that could be heard. And it's only now in my life that I feel it's possible to be more fully authentic with who I am in this space. And uh, I'm grateful to PHABC because they, <laughs> They knew and understood this about me and they hired me anyway. Um, but I thank you for sharing that and I welcome other comments. I can comment if you'd like. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so uh, my name is Stephanie and uh, my traditional name is Kishkinawa Tashkwe and Tatipuwe. Uh, and I'm a ceremony person as well as uh, a nurse and um, a bunch of other things. And so um, I really appreciated your talk, Shannon, so thank you. And um, I know it's not always easy in these environments to really fully communicate um, probably even what you really want to say. And so even some of the language that we're conditioned to using, like creation myths, um, for me and for my culture, it's very real. It's not a metaphor. Um, right. That's very hard for people that are really cemented and grounded in Western ways of knowing to appreciate because we've been so colonized deliberately to be separate from that. Yes. Um, and so when I go to ceremony and I go to these places where spiritual things are happening for some of the people there, it still remains a metaphor and it's like church and you go and you think about being a good person. But when I'm there, I understand exactly what's happening on an energetic level and it's very real. And, um, I'm called to share a story with you about what we talked about at Full Moon Ceremony on Sunday. Um, and I was really blessed to have, um, I don't know, you might know her, but um, Elder Myra Laramie there. And she came and um, she was one of the first elders to work at the University of Manitoba. That's um, where, I'm, where I am now. Um, and she talked about how thousands of years ago, um, almost at the same time when you're talking about the people that lived in the earth and when we came out of the earth, but there was a time when people and animals, and this is the same kind of story, it's linked, um, and the waters and the land and the sky could all speak the same language. Yes. And it was very easy for us to communicate in that way. And now really the only way that we're able to communicate is on an emotional resonance or an emotional level. And so some of the spiritual uh, discomfort or plight that we're feeling is because we're actually still in tune with our mother 
Um, we always need to go back to her, um, but we can't give words to it anymore because we don't, we don't speak that language anymore. And, and what separated us and kind of going back, even if you think about um, uh, Ju Judeo-Christian religion, like, the, like um, the Garden of Adam and Eve and it, it, the notion of ownership, Yes, that is what separated us. And that was done deliberately through capitalism. And so ownership leads to greed. Mm -hmm. um, and then that is why, what has separated us. And until we get back to understanding that we, we don't own and we can't legislate our way out of this crisis, um, we're not gonna be successful. I was thinking about um, our speaker that was just before this today, and he was speaking about um, how these tipping points and basins uh, are really unpredictable in terms of how we can guide our behavior. And that's actually not true. If you, if you go to an indigenous way of knowing, if you go from an indigenous worldview and you ground yourself in the seven teachings of love, humility, wisdom, respect, truth, uh, honesty, th those kind of concepts, and you, and you apply that to all things and you stop seeing people as separate from the environment, that's our guide right there. And it's very predictable what the outcome is going to be. When you're separate from those things, when you're not living in authenticity, it's going to be a poor outcome. And when we start returning to that, that's when we'll start to improve it. And so that's just my comment. And um, I didn't actually even pick to be here. I just told Christina to put me anywhere today. And um, and so that's always kind of funny how that works. And so uh, plan thank right you. There. <laughs> thanks for the platform. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Stephanie, that was so exquisite. And I actually will just share that when I was creating this, I was, I was setting the intention that there would be a voice that could really speak to this yeah. um, in the way that you have. So that's really blessed. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I think creation story is the best way. Um, and, and I also want to acknowledge the, um, the breach between perspectives that arise from Judeo-Christian ethics, which see us as, as um, less than, as, as needing redemption. Yes. Um, it, and I, I will share with you also that I'm, I'm actually a devout Catholic and that I found a lot of peace in, 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 um, in uh, the love and mercy of Christ as an ascended master. And so we're moving into very personal space here, but uh, it's because you shared that we're able yeah. to do that. And, um, and I thank you for that, yeah. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I see a lot of women in this group. I'm interested in what Tim thinks and what Andrew thinks. <laughs> well, thanks, Shannon. It's really, um, really been great to be here with you all. Um, I uh, definitely uh, feel this connection that uh, several of you have expressed um, when I am in a in a green space, um, and um, I one thing I can't help getting in a professorial role because that's what I am. But um, does everyone know about the forest wash? Yeah. Okay, so we don't need Thank to go. You. We don't need to go into the clinical trials that show that it works. Um. Well, and this is a thing we find over and over again that when we do connected work, when we do energy work, when we do balancing work, when we do grounding work, when we spend time in nature, we are healthier. We are more well because we are part of that system, that ecology. And every, you know, anyway, I, I'd love to hear from others. I I've, uh, really appreciate all of your thoughts and perspectives. I want to um, just show one image. Um, I think you've probably seen uh, this, Shannon, um, from Guy Dauncey. Um, let's see if I can get my screen share to work. Um, yeah. Just while you're doing that, I don't know if I can be heard, but I was just going to say you should say what about more about forest wash. I don't know that much about it, but I'm just oh. thinking it's going to be recorded and other people may, you know, partake of this session. And I think it would be great for you to speak to that. Okay. Yes. Um, is that all right, Shannon? Yes, please. 
Tim, we're co we're co facilitating these days. Go ahead. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, Shannon mentioned the forest wash. This is um, a practice that uh, many cultures have um, been doing for um, time immemorial. Uh, but in more recent times, uh, the Euclidean scientists have uh, tried to measure this uh, benefit. And um, some of the outcomes have been, um, you know, straightforward kind of blood pressure um, markers uh, in your blood of inflammation, um, which is a uh, root of a lot of um, chronic disease, as everybody knows, probably. Um, and uh, of course, um, questionnaire responses that describe people's feelings and that their well being or not. <clears throat> And um, in these trials, they're called, um, they're randomly controlled crossover trials, which means that the control group um, gets the intervention after the first round. So they do usually several rounds of back and forth. So it's, you're, it's a really well-designed uh, kind of study in the sense of um, no, no confounding, <clears throat> which is remarkable for epidemiology. So um, what they do is they randomize people to spend their lunch break or some other period of time, but the, the, the classic ones are kind of daytime uh, lunch break things. Half the group goes for their hour in the forest. Half the group goes um, onto a city street and spends their hour that way and they get the measurements before and after. And then they, after six weeks of that, they switch. And the population, of course, that spends the time in the green instead of on the city street, no, no matter who they are, um, have better physiological parameters. So that's the forest wash is, um, is now uh, <laughs> measured uh, if you needed that. But I just want to this about um, the economics of kindness, this concept of um, the kindness to the planet, um, because it is an ethos that um, many cultures have always had. Um, we definitely, um, in Western quote unquote civilization, as Gandhi said, that would be a good idea. Um, <clears throat> If it were possible, um, that that actually um, that relationship uh, could be quite different. Yes. And um, some people have figured out how to do it. Yeah, and um, I think you know, just sharing a couple of other experiences. Um, we went um, about twenty years ago to a celebration on Denman Island. It was the end of the summer, and there were literally wasps everywhere. There were lit hundreds and hundreds of wasps at the site that we were at. And so I said to after Rolling Thunder, and I said to my children, "Tell the wasps that you're here and that you mean them no harm, and we'll see how the weekend goes." Because they were quite young. And so each of us in our family did that. And I had my afterbite and I was prepared. My family was the only family that didn't get stung the entire weekend. So I, I applied Rolling Thunder's message, we're coming, we mean you no harm. And we spent the whole weekend and I, I, you know, I was putting afterbite on all kinds of folks and I checked in with the kids and they just had a lovely, lovely time. And it's, it's a small example um, but it is an example of ways of being in the world that are different, that, uh, that, that it's a walk with respect. I have a massive lavender bush in the front of our house. It is the king of the garden, and I've acknowledged it as the king of the garden, and I've told the lavender bush um, that, you know, you're feeding all the bees. Every day, there are 250, 300 bees in that bush. No one has ever been stung. It's right on the walkway to the front of my door. And it's, it's a dedicated space for them. And uh, I think again, in my own small little way, <laughs> that, that is an expression of consciousness. And so I think that, you know, consistent with kindness, being kind to the bees, saying this is for you, 
um, is part of moving forward in, in a more aware way with how we interact with the natural world. Um, I know that um, we have, what do we have left time-wise here? We 2.15, we have 10 minutes. I wanna make sure that Adiranki has enough material to share with the breakout because I've loved talking to you all. Yeah. Um, um, what are some key implications for collective action that, okay. that we can focus on? Yeah. And we need the top three things, right? Yeah, three to five. Yeah, and I, I want to just, uh, to get the conversation go going on this, I think um, mindfulness with respect to our relationship to nature is a thing we can do collectively more, more fully. And so I would just offer that as a way to get the conversation started. Um, but please do do share your thinking and especially those of you who haven't had a chance but go ahead stephanie if you're if you're ready yeah i was just gonna say that really um to to constantly question whose ideology or priorities and voice is being privileged and in what context and for what reason oh that's fantastic that's that's fantastic yeah and anyone else Well, for me, I think the concept of kindness to you know the animals and even people around us is a big, you know, mm -hmm. one, you know, helping us, you know, to connect. I mean, helping the interconnection between us and the nature. I think that's a big one as well. Well, that's great. And if we could share Tim's um, slide, I think that would be really helpful too. So, Tim, can you send that to Adaranke? Do you, I don't know if we can share documents or maybe you can Happy put to it do out. that. Um, Adirake, if you put your email into the chat box, I'll send it. Perfect. Yeah. Any other comments about what we can do collectively? I think we lost Andrew, but um, Kat, yeah, Dion? I think collectively um, tuning into our own intuition. Um, mm -hmm there's guidance all around us, right? And I think that disconnection from the earth, from the plants, from everything. I mean, I'm, I'm reading this book, Secret Teachings of Plants, and they're just saying, like the one piece from it that really kind of hit me, it said all ancient and indigenous peoples said that they learned the uses of plants as medicines from the plants themselves. They insisted that they did not rely on the analytical capacities of the brain for this, nor use the teachings of trial and error techniques. Instead, they said that it was from the heart of the world, from the plants themselves, that this knowledge came, for they insisted the plants can speak to human beings if only human beings will listen and respond to them in the proper state of mind. And to me, I just, there was so much in that, I just really wanted to share that because I think us listening to our intuition and kind of not being so much in the head, but more our heart and from our, our second chakra, our, our energy centers there. So yeah, just wanted to share that. I, yes, please. Hello. Sorry. I apologize. I'm a um, clinical coordinator in public health on the Island and we're the, I lead the team that's doing the contact and case monitoring for the island. So I had a few things I had to go off and do, so I, I missed some of the conversation. But um, because I was working seven days a week or several months, I, uh, I worked on Easter Sunday and some a lot of things were shut down, partially because of shut down, partially because of why not? Everybody, can you hear me okay? okay. Something going on? Okay. Um, so, and it was so quiet, I thought, you know, on Christmas Day when everything's closed, um, and I just had this sense of when a lot of the shutdown was happening, there, there was a lot more rest, and I come from a tradition where having a, like, a Sabbath or a day of rest is an ideal, and we um, kind of, uh, usually most people use their day now to catch up, right, and I, I think of the world and people all just having this idea of rest. Um, that has been lost, but I think both spiritually and just 
like the, the, ourselves as humans, animals, the world could use a rest a little more often than we give it. And I was, that was one of the things I was hoping that we would hold on to um, coming out of, of uh, wave one or whatever we, we call time going on. Um, I don't know, I think, I think everything could use that. Mm. And it could, and that's something that can be kind of legislated, right? And not to necessarily privilege one. In the past, it was it wasn't okay because it privileged one um, faith group more than others. But could is there a way we could um, just come to an understanding that this is a human spiritual thing and not necessarily one one religion? Absolutely, that's so helpful. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, there there is something about this period of human consciousness and the collective that is important in terms of a singular global threat that we're experiencing collectively. And yes, there are many cascading systems threats. I don't want to take away from that, but but there is something about COVID-19 that has given us all common cause in a way and a, and a global um, focus, which I hope and appreciate can and can have implications for many other areas. So again, it can, it can come back to Guy Dauncey's, um the economy of kindness and what does a just recovery look like and how do we take care of each other in nature. Um, and I will say that um, there is, um, I think it was New Zealand that just um, um, passed a law calling out, recognizing all animals as sentient beings. And um, so when we talk, we'll, the, I'm sure we'll hear more about the rights of nature in this, but if you come from a rights perspective with respect to this, you, and if you understand, for example, recent research saying that the trees have detailed in-depth communication systems that run beneath the earth to each other, that they are in, living in a neural net together, that we have a, abilities to be um, in higher consciousness with each other, that um, when we undertake this, uh, soulful reflection. When we undertake this work, uh, we are going to find it possible, I think, to co-create much more beautiful solutions to our challenges collectively. Um, that's 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 my personal belief. Um, but I really appreciate the uh, messaging around pausing, <laughs> and reflecting, and regenerating, as uh, we have been so busy. And uh, self-care, I think, is part of, of care for, for us. Okay, I'm conscious of our time. I think there's two minutes left. Does anybody have any closing comments they want to make before we... Adaranke, are you good? Do you feel good about your notes? Oh, yeah, well, I'm trying. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to catch up. So, um, yeah. Would anyone like to give, give the, uh, the summary, or would you prefer I do it? Uh, I'm happy to share the airtime if somebody else would like to give it. Okay, I will proceed. <laughs> okay. I appreciate it. I, I, I took a lot of, uh, I was really grateful that this was part of the content for the summer school, but it, it, it did also feel um, risky to me uh, in some ways. And uh, I really appreciate being able to share so openly with you all. And I thank you very much for your sharing with us. And it's going to be interesting to see how the larger room responds. <laughs> You're going to do great. It'll be fine. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, it'll be fine. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Okay. I personally feel that if it feels risky, um, then we're in the right space because we're on the edges, right? Pushing those boundaries into the areas that we need to. If it felt really easy and comfortable, then it would be different. So thank you for this. I, I feel privileged to have been part of this. Oh, well, bless you. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was great. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad that we've um, had this conversation. And again, it's, uh, it's, it's the beginning of a more important and larger conversation that we all need to be having, I think. Um, and I guess I just want to say thank you, Betsy, for starting us off with a, you know, with the way that we're educated, because you know how we're shaped into what is truth, what is real, what is good, what are, what are those perspectives is so is so important. 
Okay, we have five minutes. Please choose our three main points. Okay, Adiranke, can you put up our slide? Okay. <clears throat> That's what I have. Is that good enough? Can everyone see it? Yes. So um, if you go to the first notes, do you remember the first slide that you had? Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, the, yeah. Okay. So I think we'll have two. Yes, we do. I'll just stop sharing this. Thank you for all your work on contact tracing and keeping the island safe. We okay. really appreciate your seven days a week. It's it's uh it's been good learning. You made it. Yeah, I'm good. I'm here. Yeah. Um, Sylvia Robinson. I know she's at the summer school, but she has an artist who's doing paintings of public health responses to COVID nineteen uh, responses. And I wonder if you'd consider being being one of those um, people that's featured. So I'll follow up with you after. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Once. Yeah. So let's let's put this up first, and oh. then um, and that will give some context to our few points that we have on the three things we can do because I feel like it'll give it it'll make it a little bit deeper. Yeah. Um, okay. So does everybody feel okay about that? Yeah. I think desensitizing. We're all traumatized and desensitize our children. Okay, that's fine. All right, so now we could go to slide two and just check in and make sure everybody's good with those. I think she put it at the bottom, Shannon. Oh, perfect, even better. Yeah, okay. it's at the bottom, so I just copied Thank it. Thank you, that's oh, great. Yeah. Everything is on oh, one I wondered page. why you were, that's great, Adaraka. Thank you. Um, can <laughs> we add to kindness? Um, so I don't know if Tim's still there, but. Um, it was called the economy of kindness, Tim. Yeah, I was just reading something in the chat. Um, I'm having trouble actually seeing this. Let me know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say um, economy of kindness, right? Adopt the economy of kindness. Um, this is also about how we measure things, um, mm -hmm. and you know, we get hung up because you, you know, the things you can measure by dollar value, how much it costs to go get it. Um, <laughs> but this isn't, right. this isn't that way. Uh, so um, th this is also part of getting away from gross domestic product as um, our right. measure of progress. Uh, yeah. and something more akin to, um, the happiness index mm -hmm. uh, but yeah um that the the, the metric um is important well i just uh, found a book that i had used in the 70s from i think it was hazel henderson and it was on indicators uh you know measuring human growth human well-being um what gets counted counts uh really wonderful um social science challenge to us in terms of how we how we determine success. And I think actually that's been really important too when we look at why people are seen to be on the margins because the metrics that we deploy around personal well-being and happiness or readiness for school or uh, may not be the measures that are culturally relevant in that setting. And so I think there's some attention to needed to um, Western models of measurement and efficiency and effectiveness versus uh, different ways of knowing. So that'll be great. Okay, um, so- I just had a question about the, um, the bullet. Uh, we are all traumatized and I, I um, heard um, the commenter um, desensitize, uh, first it needs to be spelled correctly, but um in this crowd we have to be very careful that 
we are not talking about uh, anti-vaccination. Um, I know that wasn't what was said, but I think somebody looking at that bullet might, oh, what's going on here? Oh, okay. We'll, we'll make well, sure when I do, sorry, when I do the results that we're talking about ways people learn and experience their interaction with food and with food systems. And um, how does that work? Where's, where's yes. Betsy? Yeah, so it's the word desensitizing that can be missing. Okay. I think yeah, I, be... I, I didn't help. I used the term inoculate. And I, I didn't, I, that was meant to be ironic. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I see everybody's pouring in right now. Um, hopefully you guys all had some excellent discussions. I actually was on top of things. so. I